armed gang has attacked this house. They threaten to return for its greatest treasure. Because the owner has something the world wants, desperately. He's been described as simply the best winemaker on the planet. In the Rhone Valley in southeast France, vines are planted only where the land is angled so brazenly at the sun that the grapes will ripen fully. The most dramatic of these sun traps is the Cote Roti, or Roasted Slope. Marcel Guigal owns three tiny plots here that have become world famous. The Romans were also crazy enough to cultivate these incredibly steep slopes with vines, each one tied to several stakes for support, and no wonder. Gigals had to invent his own way of hauling the grapes up the slope to the tractor above. Hey! These are Syrah grapes, the grape of the Northern Rhone, whose wines are deep coloured, dense flavoured, often smelling of black pepper or even burnt rubber in youth, but developing over years in bottle into some of the world's most concentrated wines. Bordeaux merchants once used these grapes to add guts to their wines. <laughs> In only a decade, Gigal's turbocharged single vineyard coat rotis have become the most sought after wines in the world. He prices them quite modestly, but you can only buy a bottle of his La Mouline, La Turque, or La London if you're already an established customer and if you agree to buy a whole raft of his other wines at the same time. Because he only makes a few hundred cases of his top wines, prices rocket as soon as they hit the open market so that bottles like those will become some of the most expensive wines in the world. People will offer Gigal anything for one of these wines. Someone offered him a Ferrari, and one woman even offered herself. Gigal only got into the business because his father, a humble cellar master, went blind and couldn't work. Marcel's inherited obsessive attention to detail has made him king of the Cote Roti, flying the length of the Rhone Valley to buy grapes. He could spend the whole time with film stars in three-star restaurants, but he's a terrible delegator and instead spends most of his life on the phone. C'est la meilleure et c'est la pire des choses parce que la demande est absolument inqualifiable, c'est elle est peut-être 100 fois, 1000 fois supérieure à ce qu'on peut fournir. Donc vous devez passer combien de temps en refusant vos clients Écoutez, c'est difficile à, à, à chiffrer, mais je pense que c'est au moins 2-3 mois par an que je passe, je ne veux pas dire que je perds, pour expliquer le plus poliment, le plus gentiment possible, mais c'est très difficile, euh, que je ne peux pas donner satisfaction aux demandes. Parce que les gens qui envoient un chèque en blanc, par exemple, en disant je veux tant de bouteilles, ben, on ne peut pas leur retourner le chèque simplement. Il faut leur expliquer qu'il y en a peu, que c'est réservé aux bons clients. Qu'est-ce qu'ils font, les gens qui veulent acheter euh, 
Absolument tout. Hein. Ça, ça, ça dépasse tout ce qu'on peut imaginer. Quand on a affaire à très jolies filles, elles sont prêtes à, à beaucoup de gentillesse. Les gens, certains les volent. Volent les caisses à la cave et téléphonent après en disant envoyez, « Envoyez la facture ». Euh, certains font des cadeaux absolument euh, gênants. Euh, euh, oh, euh, J'aime bien les, les voitures. Nous, la... nous n'avions pas fermé nos volets à la maison et nous avons eu la visite de personnes qui euh, ont essayé de forcer la porte, les volets. Mais nos voisins savent à peu près qui, qui c'est. C'était des personnes qui, avaient, qui étaient cagoulées avec des fusils. Et bon, ce qu'il voulait, c'était, d'une part, c'était volé, mais je pense aussi, euh, c'était plus profond encore. Il, il nous voulait beaucoup de mal, la jalousie. Qu'est-ce qu'ils ont dit aux voisins Ce qu'ils ont dit aux voisins. Là, c'est très méchant ce qu'ils ont dit aux voisins. Ils ont... Ils ont dit, de toute façon, on ne peut pas, on peut, euh, attendez, je ne me souviens plus exactement. Euh, si on n'a pas sa maison, un jour on aura son fils. Ouf, voilà. ça doit vous donner beaucoup de peur. Hein? Beaucoup de peur. Ouais. Ouais. Workaholic Gigal does allow himself the luxury of a fast car though he needed help to start it the day he took me out in it. But his greatest pleasure in life, after his wine, comes from his passion for all things Roman. He's trying to reconstruct the glories of an empire he's only read about in books. Et alors, vous avez encore des, des projets? Disons que les, les projets se terminent. C'est un, un vieux, vieux rêve hein, qui, a, qui avait 3-4 ans, qui a germé, qu'on a trouvé très bizarre. Parce que bon, le style romain, j'ai eu envie d'avoir un espace de vie euh, agréable euh, dans le style romain, avec une véritable pierre romaine, avec, euh, avec des formes qui, qui nous rappellent cette période très, très, très illustre et très, très sympathique. Vous devez porter la toga. Mais... Ah, on va faire une soirée romaine, c'est très joli, pour l'inauguration. Est-ce que vous auriez jamais pensé que vous étiez tellement, tellement riche non, non, je suis Paris, je suis... J'ai beaucoup d'idées et j'ai la chance, bon, de, de pouvoir les, les réaliser, ce qui, est, ce qui est quand même bien agréable. Et voici la cathédrale. Gigal's vast new winery is the most cunningly designed in the world. He has two parallel grape receiving lines, like a Boeing, he says, in case one fails. And neither of them can operate unless he's there, with son Philippe looking over his shoulder. Gigal's wines are so sought after, not just because he uses so much new oak, but because he himself pays minute attention to every aspect of production. He'll only buy grapes if they meet his strict specifications. Meanwhile, the local peasants, Gigal's old school friends, some of them, have to wait outside in the rain to see whether their grapes are good enough for his wines. Even 80-year-old André, Gigal's oldest grower, is not spared this agonizing assessment of his year's output. Gigal's computer analyzes the grapes as they're tipped into the hopper. Most crucially, they must reach 10% potential alcohol. Otherwise, the grapes will simply be diverted onto another conveyor and dumped back into the truck that brought them. It would be difficult to find another buyer at this stage. It's a borderline case.
All the bewildered Andre knows is that at last his grapes get the green light, literally. <laughs> That ticket spells out Andre's total vineyard income for this year. Partly thanks to Gigal's success, partly because the wines themselves just taste so fashionably big and impressive, Rhone wines have become all the rage. This means that the world's wine producers can't get enough of the vine varieties grown in the Rhone Valley and its fringes. Not just the great Syrah of Cote Roti and Hermitage, but also Moor Vedre, and to a lesser extent Sanso and Grenache for red wines. For white wines, Roussan, Marsan, and Flavour of the Month Viognier from the Condria vineyards just round the bend there are the height of fashion worldwide, purely because of their Rhone Valley origins. Because of sudden demand for previously obscure Rhone varieties in California, Fred Klein found himself sitting on a vineyard gold mine. These were planted mostly by the um, Italian, Portuguese, and Spanish immigrants, and a few German immigrants to this country. Um, they were planted by just taking a long, about a two-foot cutting and sticking it right into the ground and hoping for the best in the, for the rains. So your family would have known a time when you could hardly give these grapes away. That's correct. We used to only get about $150 a ton for these. And that, that was mainly when we were shipping them to the East Coast to the home winemakers back there. And now? Now we're getting anywhere from $1,400 to about $1,500 a ton. <laughs> and haven't you renamed them, meanwhile? That's correct. They used to be known as uh, Mataro, or they're still known as Mataro in Spain, but um, all, the, all the people out here used to call them Mataro or Madeira, as the Italians called them, but we, of course, renamed it Morved, which is the French pronunciation. More and, chic. Uh, more chic, definitely. Um, more roni. More roni, and also more expensive, so we do get more money for them that way. <laughs> California may have had the other Rhone varieties, but what it didn't have was the real thing, Syrah, which has had to be brought in from France. Someone with a particularly bad case of Syrah mania, who's planted 12,000 of these untested vines, is Doug Danilak of Jade Mountain. I really believe that Syrah will be California's greatest red wine. Not just, you know, good and, and inky or interesting, but, you know, there's that tremendous uh, thing about young Syrah and wines off this mountain in particular. Um, you know, it's sort of jet black when it's young. It's got that inky uh, hold on color that won't let go. And, uh, you know, you can see the development. It might take 10 years, it might take 20 years, 30 years for this wine to finally come to a hole. But uh, uh, certainly that's why I think in California it's going to, it's to come together, really. But might this just not be a fad like so many things here? Not at all, no. Um, on the contrary, when you look at uh, the world's great grape varieties, um, I think that um, because there's such a popularity of Cabernet Sauvignon and Pinot Noir, which are household names, uh, when you look at the whole list of, of great grapes and great wines of the world, uh, certainly uh, Syrah belong, is, is one of those grapes. Um, in talking with many people in the wine trade, and you ask them what the greatest wine they've ever had in their life, 
Uh, it's, it's rarely Bordeaux, it's not Burgundy, but they all will mention a 61 Hermitage, uh, which to me was very telling, um, that uh, Syrah certainly belongs in that, in that family of great, great varieties. But while Syrah became an ultra-fashionable rarity in the rest of the world, in one country it grew like a weed. Only there they called it Shiraz and thoroughly despised it. Although Australia has the oldest Syrah vines in the world, until recently no one gave a damn. We had so much Shiraz around the, the Barossa and even South Australia that it, we, you couldn't sell it for love and money. Shiraz became very much the poor cousin of, of, um, of winemaking. Once it fell from grace, it was, it was just treated very shabbily. They were uh, picking the grapes half ripe uh, before they had any colour and making white wine out of it and selling it as white wine. It got so uh, bad in the end that the government was actually forking out millions uh, encouraging the growers to pull their grapes out. The vines have been brought to this valley, the Barossa in South Australia, by German-speaking settlers 150 years ago. They were hard-working Lutherans, suffering persecution in their own country. They made a deal with the British landowner who controlled the whole valley. They could buy land on the Never Never in return for working like crazy. The vine thrived here. Their original cottages are scattered all over the valley. So are their churches. And so are their graves. The great-grandchildren of these pioneers still live in the Barossa today, even though their forebears were interned as enemy aliens in the First World War. Cautious, conservative, they've created a little bit of Germany in the heart of Australia. But in the 1970s, wine became big business. The German winemaking families were swallowed up by vast corporations who set up their headquarters in the Barossa Valley with little respect for its name or its specially chocolatey Shiraz. This was a very sad era for Barossa. Once the corporate head offices came here and set up in, in the main road of Barossa, that was sometimes the only... Uh, only time that you could actually see Barossa on a label. They took the beautiful Shiraz and just left it. They didn't care where the fruit came from McLaren Vale, Coonawarra. They used Riverland, they'd use our Shiraz fruit to bolster up Riverland wines. And well, it was not a good time at all. It was really just accountants taking control and working out the cost of a litre of wine. In the late 70s, things came to a head. After several big crops, the accountants were left with a glut of grapes. The multinationals decided simply to tear up their contracts with the hundreds of Barossa smallholders whose lives depended on selling grapes. Hey, Harry. You say you want a bit of meat? At that time, Peter Lehman was in charge of the American-owned Saltram winery. Peter Lehman has in his winery, so I'd better use the Kniffel, the Mesa. What about you, Harry? But Lehman's also a Lutheran pastor's son who had grown up in the heart of the Barossa Deutsch community with all its grape growers. So in the late 70s, you were chief winemaker for one of these big wineries here, owned by a multinational corporation. And then what happened? Well, they went badly. In other words, they ran short of the necessary i.e. money. And uh, I just received a letter from them saying, for the 1979 vintage, you will not buy any grapes. Well, God, you know, this left me in a hell of a spot because when I joined the company, we were only crushing about 500, or buying about 500 tonnes. And uh, at this stage, I'd been there 8 to 16 years then, we'd got that up to 6,000. And with you know, people like this, growers, uh, just on a handshake, you look after us and we'll look after you. Well, then suddenly to be told that I'm not going to buy any grapes, so I rattled up my relations and friends, scraped up $180,000, which is a lot of money, but uh, we then went and bought two million bucks worth of grapes. So I resigned and <clears throat> went out in the wilderness, found another part or two partners, and we built this winery, which we have now, and it's been very, very successful.
So what would have happened if, if you hadn't, if Peter hadn't bought those grapes in 79? I'm blown if I know. I think we'd all be on the doll. <laughs> well, it had to be. Yeah. Had to be on the doll. I, I'm just telling uh, Ron here that, that I remember that time there we had, there were thousands of tons in the Brussels Valley. We couldn't sell it. Peter said, bring it up here. And uh, we were out there, it was getting dark, and we you know, we got unloaded, and all of a sudden, Linky's banker card come up, two big baskets full of pies and pasties. Peter looked after his growers, and there's no get away from them. We crushed a thousand tons that day, and one of my mates said, Christ, a thousand tons, how'd you do that? I said, badly. <laughs> <laughs> we got it through. Lehman, you know, bless his soul, actually came out and took the fruit, and mind you, it took him a year or two to pay for it, but at least they got their grapes sold. And most importantly, what he did then was he actually made wines from fruit grown in this area, and therefore he became the pilot light during that period when the major players didn't give a tuppenny halfpenny about this district and its region and the quality of the grapes that come out of here. What Lehman did was he, he was the one little flame that kept it alive. And he, he was good. He was really a, a great part. The Bishop of Barossa, we call him. A little bit of scunge here, but uh, we'll get that sorted out. What? Scunge? scunge. Mm. What scunge? Rubbish, rubbish. Oh. Um, God, how long have you lived here? About five years, but <laughs> other things How did you to accumulate do. all this in I'd, just five years? I had to do all the um, landscaping and everything else, so I'm just starting on here now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you laughed. It, it is a funny, funny type of idea. There's some treasures in there. And how do you find them all? Biblical system, my dear. What's that? Seek and ye shall find. <laughs> <laughs> now, what? Yeah. Is, tell me, what is so special about Barossa Shiraz? Well, Shiraz, I think, is one of the great grapes of the world, and it does particularly well in Australia, and we think particularly, particularly well in the Barossa. And, um, you know, there was a period when most people lost faith in not only Barossa Shiraz, Barossa in general, but I have always had this, and I had the history to draw back on from the great wines made at Salt before I went there, and I could see what Shiraz did. So, I, you know, the, it was like reading the Bible. It was, it shall be so. It was true. The Shiraz is a great grape. And I reckon it'll outlive a Cabernet. No, it might be a toss-up with a few years, but Shiraz, I'm, I'm just sold on it. It's great, great, great. Today, now that Australians realise just how good their Shiraz can be and how the fancy French import Cabernet Sauvignon is not necessarily one jot better, wines like these are treasured, highly priced, even fought over. Australia's most sought-after wine is Penfold's Grange Hermitage. Once dismissed as a dry port, tasting of crushed ants, it's now recognised as essence of Shiraz, pampered and matured in American oak to produce a wine that's nothing like any French wine made in the Rhone Valley, but it's none the worse for that. Outside Australia, it's sold as Penfold's Grange because the French object to this appropriation of the Rhone's most famous place name. Penfold's is the flagship company in a group called South Corp, which controls an amazing one-third of all Australian wine made today. This is the portfolio that one of their reps would use to sell to a wine shop like this. See any familiar names? <laughs> all of them are owned, ultimately, by the same water heater company. But at least it's an Australian water heater company. Penfo's great rivals, Orlando, of Jacob's Creek fame, is actually owned by the French, by Pernod Ricard. One real distinguishing mark of Australian wine labels are these. Medals won at Australia's all-important wine shows, held every year in the state capitals. Six. The Royal Hobart Wine Show, where cliques of eminent judges award gold, silver, bronze medals, or nothing at all. 153 tooth-staining wines before lunch, scores of ports afterwards. Some wine judges even get their teeth enamelled beforehand. And this is the newest judge, not absolutely sure of the rules. Is it, is it 17 that's a bronze? No, the bronze medal is uh, from 15 and a half points to 16.9. Uh -huh. Oh, I see. Oh, maybe I've been too generous. <laughs> The 
mine's okay. Mm. <laughs> Judge is a bit tough. Good show one. Good I will show be one. seduced. 18 and a half? 18 and a half. 18. 10. Um, sorry, do that again. <laughs> <laughs> Number 10. <laughs> I was going to say, you normally move your points up, Chance, it's not down. <laughs> OK, num number 10, 18 and a half. 18 and a half? 18 and a half. 18. 16. 55 and a half gold. Lovely elegant wine. See, I'm, I'm worried about that sort of carbonic maceration. A bit. very raspberry freshness about it. Hmm, I think maybe just too flattering, but am I being a sort of British too soft, masochist? It's mean, too nice. Can't be good for you. you know? <laughs> it's too much fun to drink. Uh, so we're going to go through them now. Just this is our gold medal shortlist, but apparently we don't get the final say. And then what happens then? We put them up before the chairman, and he makes the final decision. Okay, and verifies what we've done. Or argues. <laughs> that's Max Lake. Max yeah. Lake, and because he's the chairman, we agree. OK? We may not agree, but we have very little choice. You are seen to agree. We indeed, so that's what we're going to do now. Okay. So they have to agree. That's number 10. That's the wine that you uh, you felt was a little too nice. It's very delicious. But it's not for me. It's got nice uh, talent, nice, nice weight. OK, so we're all happy with that? Yep. Up to a point. Number 14. It's got a silver at the moment. My favourite. And the Jancis is marking it's a gold. <laughs> yes, we, we, we got the message. We just said there's no horse trading. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a silver. But we, have, silver. we haven't lost yet. No, we've silver. still got the chairman to come and uh, That's overrule. True. That's true. <laughs> this is it. Thank you. Yeah. OK, now, 20. It does. It's, it's, it's actually quite awesome stuff. Yeah. That's very good. Cool. 